What's up? Welcome back to the channel. This is Giants Amongst Us, where we share in that unique human experience and where you're going to hear real stories told by real people, people just like yourself. If this is your first time tuning in, first of all, pull up a chair. Please do stay a while. Know that this channel is an extension of a podcast that's already available. You can find it on whichever streaming platform you like to use. The Audibles, the Deezers, the Spotify's, whichever it is. Check it out there to listen to these stories in their entirety. And because YouTube is pretty much a video-based format, I didn't know how this was going to be received. So it's encouraging to read the comments and to see that there's some people that this is in fact resonating with. Let me know how you're listening to this. Do you throw it on as you brew your coffee? Do you put this on and let it play in the background while you get your buff and swole on in the morning? I'm curious, but thank you. I do appreciate it. If you haven't already, there's two other videos that have been put out and they were by two separate individuals who came up as a Jehovah's Witness and they share with us how it was for them coming up, the abuse that went on, the shunning that is to this day still being practiced. And they pretty much brought to light a lot of things that someone like myself who never had a direct ties to this organization would have known had they not spoken out. So I tip my cap off to them for speaking up, for being bold and brave and bringing to light what has been done in the dark. But it seems like these days, a lot of people are coming out and exposing this group, this organization for what it really is. And that's a cult. And today, I wanted to share a story about another individual who was brought up in a cult. This man, he talks about how life for him as a child was growing up with an abusive mother who kept him away from his biological father. They were bouncing around from here to there, all of it taking place in Germany. At an early age, he went through a lot. Physical, sexual, mental, emotional abuse. When the authorities police officers, school members, and all these other adults did nothing to him every time he cried for help. He decided at 15 years old, it's time to go. He got in the wind, left, and through all the pain and the suffering and the trauma, the guilt of blaming himself for years, something that's common amongst people who have been through abuse, neglect, and trauma. They blame themselves. Through all this pain and this hurt, his story doesn't end there because he talks about how he was able to find healing and work towards forgiveness. How was he able to forgive a mother who put him through everything that he went through? Emmanuel shares that with us today. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, this is Emmanuel and his story. I, I use any opportunity to uh, tell my story. I I think it's important, and I I, I love your angle of uh, you know having a positive impact on people and people being able to take something away from uh, other people's experiences. Um, my my actual family was very very small because, like I said, uh, you know sometimes my mother. Was, was living in communes to, together with me. So in that sense, that was like, that was my family. But my actual family was only my mother. That's why I said it starts with my birth because um, I was I was born, uh, you know, I'm German, and but, but I, I wasn't born in Germany. And, um, and I, I lived all over the place. Uh, and, um, and that was mainly because um, my mother, didn't want my father to to be able to see me uh so so that's why i was born in a different country and that's why we always moved to different places and that's you know that's why it's difficult to to talk about my childhood out of curiosity how old was your mother when she had you um 28 in a way i was her second child but i, I was her only child but in a way and then you know, I was her second child in the sense that before she had me, 
she had an abortion. So and and she didn't want to have that abortion. You know, it was it was her father and um, and her boyfriend that pressured her into having uh, an abortion, mm -hmm. and that traumatized her. She felt guilty, even though it wasn't her fault. There was nothing to feel guilty about, you know, uh, as far as I'm concerned. You know, if, if she was pressured into doing that, it, it's not her fault, right? But she felt guilty anyway, and um, so she she was looking for a way uh, uh, to, to make up for that. And she figured, well, if she just has another child and doesn't abort it this time, she can, she can make up for having aborted the first one. And um, and so, so she just kind of, you know, picked up my father in, you know, in some bar, you know, just it was just like the first dude uh, uh, she met and she threw herself at him mm -hmm. uh, just just to have the child. And and after she was pregnant, uh, he, he served his purpose. She didn't she didn't like man because of her own um, negative uh, experiences with men and having been forced to have the abortion and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so that that's how all that uh, came about. You know, now in preparation, I looked at it again a little bit and I noticed that one of the gods or one of the divine beings, uh, divine beings is a better word, one of the divine beings they believe in is actually called Emmanuel. So mm -hmm. it's actually, you know, it's my name. I figured, I, I, never, I never noticed that before. I never saw the, that before. But did my mother give me that name because that uh, a, a religious group believes in, in, in that being as, as a divine being? You know, they, they have a divine being called Emmanuel. I, I never thought about that before. I never realized that before. But I think my mother actually intentionally gave me that name because of that. And I, I never knew for certain if she was already in contact with that religious group when I was born, but I think she must have been, yes. When I was very young, you know, she was moving around a lot. And then, then there were, you know, it was a period of time, a couple of years, where, where she settled uh, in, in that area of the religious group and where we uh, were, were living on the property of that religious group. Uh, and, and that lasted the longest time. That was the longest time we, we stayed in one place because... We stayed in that place for I, I don't know maybe like seven or eight years, which which was very long. It was the longest time in my childhood that we stayed in one place. And and other than that, it was all just you know moving from from one place to another, usually within a couple of months. Can you for that seven year period? Can you kind of give us an idea of how it was being involved in that community? <sighs> Yeah, um, well, we can use names. <laughs> um, it's called, uh, well, in English, it would be called universal life. In German, it's called universelles Leben. It's a, it's a German Christian, or at least they call themselves Christian, uh, new religious movement, you know, as, as you as you're supposed to say nowadays, instead of cult. <laughs> <laughs> is that, is that the new just word? Kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah. So it's, a, yeah, it's a, um, it's a Christian neo-Gnostic uh, sect uh, that's, that was at the time, at the time was very popular here in, in that area. So I live in Bavaria and uh, one city in particular where they were very popular back then. But, but outside of that, that, they're probably not as well known, but still, uh, you know, I, th I think it's still relevant um, because the, the way they operate and the way all of that happens is, is maybe pretty typical. And and a lot of, you know, a lot of similar groups uh, uh, probably operate very similarly. So um, I imagine that even if people don't know that specific group, they, they might know a group uh, like that. Uh, they, they have a lot of properties, both both now and back then. You know, they they own a lot of buildings around here, a lot of a lot of farms around here, a lot of um, compounds, basically. Yeah, so so a lot of real estate. You know, they they have a lot of real estate, and so she moved uh, here to live. Uh, you know, on on one of their farms and basically dedicate her whole life to them and work uh, with them, work for them. It was really, it was like a 
like a bit like a communist commune in a sense, you know, everyone was working together and there wasn't really a concept of money. Everyone was kind of sharing everything, you know, I, I don't think they do that anymore. Little disclaimer in, in case uh, someone from that group listens to that and, and maybe gets offended and says, oh, that's not how it is. I, I don't think they do that anymore now. You know, that, that whole commune aspect. I don't think they have that anymore. But back then, they were emphasizing that a lot. So later on, that, that was when I was already out, right? But, then they, but then, then they started to really have schools and to really focus on children. But back then, they didn't. So back then, they didn't have schools of their own. And they didn't really target uh, uh, children yet. So that the whole, back then, the whole doctrine and, and all the teachings were focused on adults. I didn't, I didn't really care for, for, for that at, at all because it didn't, it didn't speak to me. You know, at, at, at that time, they were really focused on, on targeting adults that were disappointed uh, with the Catholic Church because in this area, I mean, it's not the case anymore. Now, now they're all atheists. Now everyone, almost everyone in Germany is basically an atheist. Even if they, even if they say they're not atheists, trust me, they're atheists. I've, <laughs> well, anyway, most German, most Germans are atheists now. But back then, at least in that area, everyone was Catholic, and back then everyone genuinely believed in God. At, at least they, you know, at that time they still kind of did. So they were targeting these kinds of people, you know, um, who truly believed in God, but who were disappointed uh, with the Catholic Church. Because obviously, you know, if you're a Christian, if you read the Bible, you, you, you'll discover some discrepancies uh, between how Jesus acted and how the Catholic Church and the Pope acts, right? So they were targeting these kinds of people and was very effective, but it meant nothing to me as a child. In a way, it's a little similar, a little similar to Islam or to, or maybe to Mormons, in in, in the way that they have their own prophet. In in this case, a woman. They 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 say they're Christian, but and and they say they believe in the Bible, but in reality, they kind of really don't. What they truly believe in is these revelations by their what, what's a female form of prophet? Uh, prophetess. Right by their prophetess. Okay, so that's what they truly believe in. So every once in a while, uh, back then, the prophetess would still come out with new revelations, so to say. And uh, that was like a big event, and everyone was going there. Even though you never saw her in person, it was always on tape. <laughs> right? So those, those, those events were big, and my mother, of course, always went there to, to, to hear the newest revelation. And, uh, and, and of course, she, she dragged me along. And, of course, you know, I... I didn't know what to do during that time. So so they started arranging, you know, like they, they would have like a big conference room where, where, where the prophetess on tape would give her newest revelation. And then in the next room, they, they, they would organize a little room for the children to play. So so that, that was the extent of, of their programs uh, for children back then. And that's also a big aspect for why I, I didn't go to school uh, most of the time. So most of the time I wasn't in kindergarten and I, I didn't go to school because my my mother wouldn't let me. <laughs> Even though in Germany, you know, there, there's no such thing as being homeschooled in Germany. In Germany, by law, you have to go to school. Uh, but since they, they didn't have schools of their own and since uh, public schools were kind of demonized I, I just simply didn't go to school and I didn't I didn't my, my mother didn't let me to go to school anyway mm -hmm. you know even you know independently from from that group she, she didn't really want me to go to school I in any case so if we weren't at that compound then most of the time I would just have my mother at that compound at least I, I had contact with, with these other people there right I never had a normal childhood no and uh, so, so eventually I ran away. I left the group and I, I left my mother. Like we were talking about, you know, when before we started, that ties in into some of the more difficult and, and, and serious aspects. And that's that I was abused, even sex, sexually abused. Uh, so, so that's why I ran away. And it, it wasn't because, you know, it wasn't the, the people in, in, in the religious group that abused me. Well, it, it was. It was since my obviously since my mother was 
part of that religious group. But anyway, no, it wasn't it wasn't the people in the religious group that abused me. It was my mother that actually sexually abused me. Uh, so that that was obviously the most difficult for me. And that that's why it was never easy for me in my childhood, especially when I was still around uh, my mother. You know, no matter if she was in that religious group or not, obviously it was always difficult for me to be around my mother. That, that's my, you know, I eventually ran away from my mother. You know, normally you, you, you'd, you'd have like, you know, you'd have like child protective services or something helping you. And th- that's also why my mother moved around so much. It's, it's to, to avoid uh, the, the authorities, right? And, and she was pretty good at avoiding the authorities and staying off grid. Um, you know, other than in, in such communes. But these communes, at least back then, were off-grid themselves. So she always kind of stayed off-grid. Uh, so so there, there weren't a, as many outsiders around to, to help me. And even if I did manage to, to talk to someone, or I, I even tried to talk with the police. Uh, but back then, it was just, you know, the people didn't believe, couldn't believe that. They, you know, they believed me. I remember talking to the police and they, they believed me up to the point where it became clear that the allegations of, of sexual abuse were not against my mother. Uh, no, the other way around. We're not, we're not against my father, but against my mother. And they, they couldn't imagine that. You know, they, they couldn't imagine that uh, my mother would do that or that a woman would do that. So they simply didn't believe me. So at, in the end, I, I didn't see any other way uh, than to run away. During the abuse, while you were in these um, these communities, was there ever anybody around that seen or had a feeling about something going on? Uh, that's that's dif- that's difficult. I, I I I don't. Well, on the one hand, I don't want to say anything wrong. You know, I don't. I don't want to accuse that group of of of, of something it didn't do. Uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, I honestly, I I really don't know. It wasn't just the people in that religious group. It was, it was everyone that that saw that. And, you know, I mean, most people that that had contact with me or my mother saw that there was something off going on, but most of them had had just kind of had the attitude of, of looking the other way. And like I said, back then, people just couldn't imagine that a, a, a woman uh, would do something like that. You know, if, if it was the father, it was something different. But with, with a woman, they, they couldn't imagine that. It was kind of the attitude people had back then. I don't know. It, it, was, it was like that with other groups as well. You know, no matter where we were, and even if I, you know, there was a, at least a short period of time where my mother actually, uh, you know, eventually she realized, okay, I, I need some schooling, right? So eventually she did send me to school. So it's not like I never went to school. But even when I went to school, um, it was a it was a private school. It wasn't it, like I said, there were no um, there were no schools of of that um, uh, religious group. Uh, by now they have their own schools, but back then they didn't. So uh, and and since uh, public schools were demonized, you know, she she at least sent me to another private school, a, a private school that again emphasizes uh, spirituality a lot, and and they also gotten you know some criticism, and um, the teachers knew what was going on, you know, they they saw that, but they didn't help me, and um, I spoke with one of my teachers lately, you know, like after twenty years. And he explained uh, what was going on. And, and, you know, he just, you know, blatantly explained to me that, that he was actually told that if they see abuse, um, even, even sexual abuse, if they see that some of the children who go to that school uh, are sexually abused by, by their parents or whoever, they were specifically told not to report that to the authorities. And the reason was that that was a private school, and I'm not gonna, I'm not going to say uh, uh, what school it was. That's not important, you know. But it, it was a private school that faced a lot of criticism in the past, you know, precisely because you know people were already concerned for the well-being of the children there. So they were like, well, if you know, if that comes out, then that's that's just gonna you know make us 
look even worse. And that was kind of the reaction of everyone, you know, no matter if it was the school or if it was um, the religious community or if it was um, the village, uh, wherever I was, people didn't want something like that to come out anyway because they felt it would make their village or their religion or their school or their whatever look bad. I don't know if that ideology and that belief is good or bad. I'm not going to pass judgment. But I, I just felt it necessary to get away from, from all of that at that time. And especially, of course, get away from my mother. The way I did that, well, originally my plan was to, you know, just just get help from the authorities, you know, get help maybe from my grandparents. They They were one of the few people who believed me. But again, you know, Basically, because of solidarity to uh, my mother, <laughs> they did. They didn't help me. Uh, so you know, then I tried getting help from uh, uh, from my teachers at school because at that time I, I was going to school. But you know, I just you know just told you how that went, and, and you know, then as a la- as a last resort, I I simply tried calling the police. And that didn't work either because they you know I, I explained a little. They didn't believe me because they, you know, I had I had their full attention uh, until the moment they realized my accusation wasn't against my father but against my mother, and they, they couldn't at that time they couldn't really believe that so they didn't didn't take me seriously, so I was left with no option or at least I felt I had no option and I didn't I didn't get any help from anybody at least that's how I felt at that time, so I didn't see any other option than than to run away by by, by my own and. Um, the way I did that, now that I think about it, was actually pretty clever because, uh, of course, you know, eventually, you know, there were some troubles and eventually I, I did end up on the street. Uh, but at least initially, of course, the plan wasn't to end up on the street, right? And I, and at, at least initially that worked. I didn't end up on the street. Um, and, and the way I did that was simply, you know, um, simply con- to confront my mother and simply, you know, tell her that, Either you 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 pay for my own apartment, or, or I'm gonna uh, tell the authorities everything I know. And the next day, I had my own apartment, and she paid for it. At least you know the first few months, and then I was sort of on my own. But yeah. And how old were you? Fifteen. Since starting with fifteen, I didn't really have anyone to 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 take care of me, and my my mother only uh, paid the rent initially, and then I you know. Had to figure out how to pay the rent myself, which, which I couldn't always do. So I had to figure out uh, uh, ways to make money and to get a job. Even at a young age, I, I needed a job, obviously. But it was very difficult for me to get a job uh, because I was at a job interview. I would always be very nervous and I would always mess it up and uh, I would be socially awkward and I wouldn't know why. And that went on for a long time. It was a real struggle for me. And I, uh, I was like, wow, why is this happening? Why, why, why can't I get a job? Why am I so socially awkward? Yeah. And then I figured, well, maybe it's because of all all the sexual abuse that I've been repressing for twenty years. Right, the whole point was to not have an abortion again. But what is she gonna do if the child she has turns out? to be male. She's going to have a problem with that. And she did have a problem with that. But then again, she can't get an abortion again because the whole point was to not have an abortion. Right. So that that was a bit of a problem for her because she really, really, really wanted and needed a a, a girl um, because she was afraid of men and she hated men for what they have done uh, to her, even though, you know, it's not it's not like man did that. It's it's specific man that did that. But she she blamed it on all men. Right. So so she figured, like I said, you know, at least back then, that that religious group was kind of like a commune. And uh, even though it's it builds itself as a as a Christian religious group, there are actually a lot of, well, a lot of leftist ideology that's in there. I mean, they also have some 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 extreme right wing stuff, but anyway, the point is, my mother was also mm, very much uh, a, a a communist, and she was actually, you know, you know, back back when East Germany was still around, and so she actually had a lot of connections uh, to 
uh, to that as well. So she was she wasn't just she wasn't just a normal uh, uh, communist party member, but um, how do you say that? Like a, a communist of, official, basically. Uh, so she was very much indoctrinated um, with that kind of ideology as well. And um, one aspect of that they they teach you in in like Marxism one hundred and one is that um, there is nothing that is inborn. Basically, we are a product of our environment, like completely. There's nothing inborn. So she believed that. So she figured, well, if she just you know uh, raises me as a as a girl, then because gender in her mind is a uh, societal construct. As long as she just simply raises me as a girl, I, I will magically become a girl. I mean, obviously, I'm not gonna have the parts, but, but other than that, I'm I'm gonna behave just like a girl, and it's gonna be fine. So she actually um, raised me as a girl, or at least she tried to raise me as a girl because I didn't like that at all. But that's that's how everything basically started because I refused to be a girl. I didn't want that. So she, she started uh, uh, punishing me for that. And, you know, she had to beat me. She had to use, that's when she started using physical violence because that was the only way to get me to act like a girl uh, because I didn't want that. And un- unless she used physical violence, there was no way she's, she's, she, she was going to get me to behave like that. So at that point, she had to use physical violence, at least in her mind. So, and then also the the sexual abuse uh, started as well, because the moment I refused to uh, uh, become a girl, that was what made it possible for her to do that stuff to me, because because then I I wasn't a child anymore. I wasn't an innocent child. I was I was a man. I was part of the group that did all these terrible things to her, at least in her mind, you know, because she she wasn't really able to differentiate between individuals in a group, you know, because because that's that's what she believed. She 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 was judging everyone based on their on their group, not on on the individual. So the the moment I I, I refused to be a girl, she she started to also sexually abuse me. It's always kind of there. It's it's like. I don't know how to describe that. Maybe, maybe a kind of subconscious fear, you know, because because you've been traumatized, you're always kind of afraid of that happening again, and that fear never goes away completely. Well, but you can get to the point where you control the fear instead of the fear controlling you. Because of all these bad experiences, and initially, I. I was also like feeling like, oh, it, in a way, I was also blaming God and, and I didn't have any faith. But then I realized that just because, you know, some religions mess up, that doesn't mean uh, it's it's God's fault. And so for me, it was also important to to, to have my own faith and my own faith in God uh, and, and not, not necessarily, you know, ha- having any religious community. I always try to to separate that. And in German, you say, well, you say the same as in English, actually. You say religious community. So, um, or, or, or faith, or faith community. No, in German, in German, you say faith community. Glaubensgemeinschaft. So a lot of, a lot of people focus on, on the community, but not on the faith, you know, but you can have faith without the community. What do you need a community of, of humans for? You can, you can, you can just have you know your own faith in God. You don't. You don't need the community aspect. So it was. So that was something that, for me personally, was most important was to regain my faith in God. Mm. Well, last year I got a call because I didn't have any contact with her for for like many many years, for for decades actually. So now now I kind of regret that. You know, at least after the first decade or so, I should have. I should have tried having contact with her again. I mean, like I said, I did. I did try to have contact with her, and it just it just didn't work. But still, now I feel that maybe maybe I should have tried harder, because last year I got a call from from someone that I I, I knew from my childhood, and she told me that my mother had passed away. I was always hoping that someday it would be possible for me to to have a normal conversation with her and maybe to talk about all that. Yeah, and and you know, so so that came that came kind of suddenly, because I kept my distance, and 
I, I needed distance. But that also meant that no one um, was was telling me about her, and no one was telling me that that she was sick. I didn't I didn't know that she was sick at all. And I feel you know obviously they should have they knew that I wanted that I needed distance and I didn't want to talk to her. But still, they 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 should have realized that if she's sick, then they should have told me about that. So it turns out she was sick for a long time, and and then she died. Even if you might not believe in in God, you got to admit that if someone believes in God and believes that eventually God will judge people, it helps them not to judge people by themselves, right? Not to uh, and and not not to seek revenge. I don't I don't need to seek revenge, you know, because I believe God will judge me. Thank you all for sticking around and sharing in this unique human experience. If you guys found value in it in any way, if it resonated with you, you know, you can share your thoughts and leave some feedback in the comments below. You can also find us at giantsamongstus.com where you can also share your thoughts via voice message directly through email. Whichever floats your boat, appreciate you all. We're going to catch up and do this again. Stay safe, stay sane. And if you would like to be a part of the show and share your story or even a story of someone in your life that has impacted you in a positive way, you can always reach out to me via email. I'd be happy to connect. Until next time, and very soon, peace. I'm looking for a sign to know I'm on the right road. Ain't seen no sign since Jericho. 